Well, according to Jasper and Sid, the quicker I do this, the quicker we can get to Hard Rock Cafe, but we have to give our next guest speaker a bit of respect. And uh, he holds a very prominent position in Asian sport. They've been one of the leaders of driving Asian content and Asian sport and the sport, Asian sports industry for many, many years. And please welcome to the stage... Andrew Giorgio, the CEO of World Sport Group. From my graduation, 50,000 year old, buy a lot of beer. Things are going great, and they're only getting better. I'm doing all right, getting good grades. The future's so bright. I've got a wish. Well, Andrew, welcome. Right, two Aussies up on stage for a change. We'll try and keep it very international. Talking about Asia. Yes, talking about Asia. And luckily we've been up here uh, for quite a few years now, you and I, but it is exciting times. Um, compared to many sports 20 years ago, we didn't have Asian golf stars, we didn't have many Asian footballers playing in European or UK leagues, but now we have an Asian football uh, industry and then we've got an Asian golf tour or two of them, something we didn't have before. Yeah, I think... Um uh, the key takeaways from today, uh, the place to be is Asia. Um, the, the development of this part of the world um, is, as my boss used to say, a mathematical certainty. It's only a matter of time um, between that this part of the world will eventually become dominant in everything that we do. Um, the population size, the, the GDP growth, uh, sponsors looking to get access to this part of the world means that sport is going to be big in this part of the world. Um, we heard from PwC this morning about um, statistics, um, and they're important because they provide some guidance to us and, and what we should do. Um, the key message there was that Asia is actually underperforming um, compared to the rest of the world. Um, the trick for everyone in this room is to figure out how to catch up. Indeed. And... It will take time, but it's come a long way, hasn't it? And the key to that, of course, is it Asian sport for Asian local audiences. Yeah, that's, that's certainly a philosophy that our business believes in. Um, we have spent 20 years in this part of the world investing in local sport, and, and I think the theme that's come through today uh, quite strongly in most of the conversations that have had is local content. Um, and that's something that we are uh, fiercely um, philosophical about, um, something that we, we won't do as a business because ultimately we believe that um, in order to speak to communities within this part of the world, you need to deliver genuine um, local content. It has to be genuine. It has to be local. Um, and we've seen over the years in this part of the world many sports rights holders try to take advantage of Asia um, by visiting here and then going away. Um, and to me, that's um, you know, effectively like you know, stealing money. Um, you're coming here, you're taking money away, and, and you're buzzing off. And, and I think uh, Asia is waking up to that. Uh, I think um, Asian uh, communities, Asian governments, Asian sponsors are waking up to the fact that actually we want to invest in something that's going to stay here, that's something that's going to promote um, local development, something that's going to promote local business. Um, and I think the more that we can focus on the development of that local content, the engagement with community, the use of social media to do that, um, I think is going to be key, especially in this part of the world. I think the more that we can do that, uh, I think the better off this industry is going to be. Um, and for me, you know, somewhat, I think, controversially, we, we don't really support too much foreign events coming into, into Asia. Exhibition um, sports is not something that we do. European football club tours is not something that we do. We don't do it because we don't believe it actually creates value for, for the development of sport in Asia. We like um, events that stay here. Um, events that are consistently here developing and promoting sport in this part of the world, developing um, events here, and more importantly, developing athletes here, um, the superstars. Um, you talk about um, the, the two golf tours that are, that are persisting down this path of trying to create a dominant force for golf in, in Asia. Uh, and, and that, for me, is about trying to capture the opportunity that we all believe will exist, that the next Tiger Woods will be from Korea or from China, or, or from somewhere in Southeast Asia, uh, and how we provide them with a platform in this part of the world to ply their trade. Um, so, you know, the Asian tour and, and One Asia are both trying to position themselves to capture that opportunity. But that, that's good. That, that's a good thing that 
both those tours are doing because actually what they're trying to do is develop local sport and, and that's to be respected and I think that's something that we um, foresee more and more of in the future. Where do you see the key sports in Asia at the moment? Uh, obviously football, cricket, is cricket one, two and three? <laughs> yeah. um, I think, I mean, one of the interesting things um, that I find having these kinds of conversations is we talk about Asia as if it's one homogenous kind of landmass, and, and it really isn't. Um, um, I think Jasper said before it's 28 different countries. In, in our world, it's 47 different countries in a football context. Uh, we include the Middle East and, and, and APAC in that. Um, but whether it's 28 or 47, they're very different places. Uh, and what works in one country, I think, is going to be very different to what works in another country. Um, Pan-regionally, I think there are only very few sports that work, if you're looking um, to take advantage of a strategy that works across the region as a whole. Um, I think, you know, golf certainly does, football certainly does, and, and I would classify football um, as one, two, and three. Uh, and tennis um, is certainly taking that uh, opportunity as well. Um, I think anything else, I think, is much more localised. Um, you look at cricket in India, um, it's so far ahead of anything else um, that if you want to activate based on uh, sport in that part of the world, then it's hard to look past um, cricket to do it. Um, it also depends, of course, on your budgets um, because it means it's expensive. But I think expensive is only relative to the value you get back. Um, and if you're the dominant sport in India, um, then you get a lot of value from it. So I think it really does depend on what market you're talking about. Um, a lot of the sponsors that we are speaking to and have spoken to in the past um, have looked for um, pan-regional opportunities, uh, a kind of one-size-fits-all, and there's only very few sports that can do that. Um, I think the sponsors that are willing to work a little bit harder um, can unlock uh, greater opportunity by looking at uh, specific markets and, and focusing on those markets. Um, what's um, possible in Korea and Japan um, may not be relevant to the rest of the world. You know, baseball, for example, in those two countries is, is significant sport, huge. Um, but if you're a sponsor looking to roll out an Asian platform, then um, I wouldn't possibly recommend uh, baseball because it doesn't work in many other parts of, the, of Asia. Well, and a little bit in Taiwan, to be fair, and they watch a lot of Japanese baseball. You've got Philippines, we're very big into basketball and not much else, and, and pool. But there's surely a place for local competitions like the M League and the J League. But even, you know, the Suzuki Cup's a fantastic tournament, the Southeast Asia regional scenario. But they also will take time to develop. Yeah, I think, I think people underestimate the, the role of time. Um, you know, I think everyone in this room would want to see um, us to be able to flick the switch um, and, and turn the light switch on for uh, Asian sport. But I think it will take time. I think it, it starts at the grassroots. Um, and, and there's no escaping that. Any way you start this conversation, you have to end up at grassroots. Um, at kids playing sport, uh, at people watching sport, at you know, that participation rate that everyone talks about in their respective countries. You know, how many people are going into the top of the funnel? Um, then it has a result of how many people come out the bottom of the funnel in the elite pathway. Um, and so for me, it starts and ends at community, and that's a generational thing. Um, there are pockets uh, of community that are already there, depending on the sport, but uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done at a, at a grassroots level to get that engagement with, with sports fans. Um, and that just takes time, and you can't escape the role of, of time in, in doing that. Do you find it hard to find Asian companies that understand uh, Asian sport and who want to sponsor Asian sport? I, I commented after um, Giles um, got up here, and I, um, I don't know him, and he doesn't sponsor anything that we do, um, but I wish I had 150 Giles Morgans um, running you know, companies in Asia. Um, because yeah, yeah. the conversation you can have with uh, a client like that is a very straightforward conversation. One of the biggest challenges we have with, um, with companies is when you go in and do exactly what Giles suggested, which is go and find out what the client wants. Heaven forbid we should ask the question as to what they want rather than what we've got to sell. Um, the problem with some of the sponsors that we talk to is they don't know the answer. They can't, uh, they can't articulate exactly the objectives they have set for themselves and therefore selling sponsorship to them becomes really, really difficult. Um, I cringe every time and I was in a meeting earlier this week with, um, with someone who, who started talking about sponsorship. We have to find the person within the company that likes the sport. 
and you kind of go, oh, that's so that's such a deflating conversation to have. It, it's just so old school, and it turns the conversation, um, a, a proper business conversation, into one of personal discretion and whim. And trying to run a business um, on uh, personal discretion and whim, I think, is fraught with danger. And I think in, in Asia at the moment, and one of the comments that um, Jasper posed is, is sponsorship a dirty word? And, and sadly, when you have those kinds of conversation, I think sponsorship has become a dirty word, you know, because people do see it as the, um, the discretionary right of the chairman to choose where to spend, you know, you know sponsorship dollars. Uh, and I think that's, that's unconstructive. Uh, and I think what is constructive is um, setting the objectives, identifying your business objectives, setting the, the, the ROI against that, and then setting the sponsorship objectives, which you can then communicate to um, the sport, the agencies that re represent sport, and have a sensible conversation about how sponsorship can actually deliver proper business outcomes. Because when people talk about it in those terms, then they're measurable and accountable, um, and then you know that the money that's being spent actually meets its targets. You know, a, a CEO of a, of a local bank that I was speaking to recently said, but how do I know my sponsorship will work? And you, it's, it's a depressing conversation when the sponsorship manager is sitting next to him and he's asking me that question. And that's, that's the process we have to go through with um, with Asian brands um, at the moment. I mean, it's come a long way, don't get me wrong. Um, in the last 20 years that we've been operating in this part of the world, it, it has come a long way, but I think there is still um, a lot of work to be done. You think there's a place for the sponsorship association that we're launching tomorrow and that we're all wanting to be a part of and stakeholders in to set up training and, and mini courses or short courses for brands that are like here today? To understand, I, I think that should be, you know, its first to tenth objective. Quite frankly, um, if that uh, association can deliver one thing, and that thing being being able to um, create the clear um, process by which sponsors want to engage with sport and how to measure and evaluate that, then that would be a huge success story for that association. Because then you can have the kinds of conversations that we want to have, which is how can we use sport to help you connect to passionate consumers and therefore how does it help you meet your business objectives. There's an interesting point also that Giles made that there's no point comparing the metrics and the analytics of what Coke wants to do with an event versus what HSBC does. No, <laughs> absolutely not. And y you look at what um, Coke has done with the Olympic movement. You know, the, the Coke doesn't need branding. You know, but so what, it sponsors the Olympics. What it needs is access to people who drink Coke and, and want to influence their um, perception of that brand and how many people buy the stuff. Um, and branding is not important to them. Um, other sponsors are going to be completely different to that. In Asia at the moment, um, we have a lot of conversations um, with um, sponsorship managers that say, well, what's the media value? And you kind of go, okay, well, that's only really the last question, you know, we feel you should be asking. That's the icing on the cake many, many times. Um, but so much so, you, we see brand managers who, who want to talk about media value because it's a easy metric to be able to cover yourself off about what this sponsorship delivered. If you want brand awareness, you know, advertising is an, is an alternative. But that's not what sponsorship is about. Sponsorship is about something much more than just branding. Uh, it's an opportunity to engage uh, in a way that you can't really do with many other um, marketing techniques. Yes, indeed. And part of that uh, is what sports do you see <coughs> emerging here in Asia? I mean, it's amazing how many brands don't advertise on sport. And the ones that, that used to, like JVC used to sponsor badminton throughout Southeast Asia very yeah. predom uh, predominantly. But uh, where do you see the next tier of sports emerging? Is it badminton, table tennis, ten-pin bowling, pool, snooker? Yeah, I think I think depending on the market again, I think you know badminton, Malaysia, Indonesia, India um, can be quite successful. I think obviously table tennis in China can be enormously successful. Um, baseball in in Korea and Japan can be can be huge. I think the, the 
when we talk about the complexity of the media environment at the moment, a lot of the sports are still very much relying on broadcast media to be the, the, the revenue source that, puts, that, that allows them to grow. And what we're seeing again is, you know, premium sport will hold a very unique place and, and that, that premium is becoming even more premium now. Um, so you have to be ultra premium, if I can use that expression. You have to be ultra premium to get the attention of broadcasters to pay you real money for, for your product, um, which makes the, the, the long tail of sport even longer. Um, and I think the challenge for a lot of the um, secondary sports is to figure out a commercial model that doesn't necessarily make them rely on broadcast media as their primary funding source, and that's a real challenge. Um, but equally an opportunity for a lot of what we've been talking about today. Yeah, and the role of and the role of digital, uh, I think, is you know is part of that. Uh, and there's a lot of conversation about digital and what digital means. And you know, there's there's a digital distribution of live content, uh, and that's uh, I think pretty straightforward. Whether you you, you deliver you know, a football match on a mobile phone or a badminton match on a tablet, I think that's pretty straightforward. I think what um, digital really means to us and, and what we're spending a lot more time focusing on for, for brands and for second tier sports is how can you create that community engagement if you don't have the broadcast platform? Because the broadcast broadcast platform is, is, a, is a means of communication to, to ultimately your consumers. So what other alternatives are there to be able to create that engagement? Um, and digital has got to play that bridge. Uh, and for those second tier sports, the digital platforms that they create and the communities they create off the back of those digital platforms, I think are going to be the lifeblood of their financial and commercial models moving forward. Sadly for them, there's also a time factor in that because uh, I think in terms of what we see, um, broadcast media is still going to be so important for the next five to ten years um, in terms of value creation. Um, but I think you know we have to set ourselves up for, over that time frame, especially if you're those second tier sports, to have a look at how you employ digital strategies to set yourself up for when uh, advertisers really do figure out how to monetize um, and access that digital platform in your particular sport. Um, for me, it's a, it's a conversation that's very complex. I don't think anyone's really got the answer um, to it, but I think everyone recognises that those platforms, that engagement, you know, with your fans, you know, beyond the first whistle and the last whistle over the course of 12 months, um, and how you how you create that, I think people all agree um, that's going to be um, hugely important. I, I'm not sure everyone's figured out um, exactly how you create the value off the back of those because the um, the costs um, that advertisers are willing to pay for that um, are a fraction of what they're willing to pay at the moment for broadcast media uh, and we need to change that as well. Indeed. Well, to a next point and, and part of what you're looking after these days is the Sports Hub, a, a fantastic uh, stadium and scenario, uh, project that it's going to be iconic and so uh, you're out there, no doubt, looking to attract events to Singapore. So what are the, some of the things that you're saying to them as why they should come and what particular sports are you chasing? Yeah, the, the Sports Hub, I think, is, a, is an interesting um, topic because I think it, it also speaks to the development of sport in Asia as a whole. Um, you know, we talk about what we need to do to promote sport and we talked about creating local content, we talked about um, creating community uh, and engaging community around sport, um, but you also need the investment in infrastructure to be able to do that. Um, I sat this morning and listened to, to Lionel talk about um, the government's policy um, around why they invest in sport. And again, it's wonderfully refreshing to talk to um, you know, a government department that has clear policy directives around why it invests in sport. It makes your target much easier to hit um, than if they can't. And, and, and Lionel and the STB are only one of a number of government agencies that has um, an interest in sport. Um, the Singapore Sports Council has its Vision 2030. Um, again, they've articulated their uh, objectives clearly for everyone to see. 
Um, you know what the targets are. You know what they're trying to achieve. Um, you then talk to the Ministry of Education and what they're trying to do with sport and how they're trying to introduce sport into the schools. Um, you talk about, um, in Singapore, the, the, the health sector and, and, and the government department about the role of sport in, um, in creating a healthy community. Um, and you talked about the government about the role that sport can play in actually building a sense of um, national pride. And, and what you have is um, a government in Singapore that's been able to articulate how it intends to use sport to meet its, its objectives. Um, and as a result of being able to articulate those quite clearly, um, you then can make the decisions and the investments required in order to act upon that. And the Sports Hub is um, one of those decisions that they had to make if they wanted to use sport to achieve all those things. You can't um, host sport without the proper facilities. So they've invested in infrastructure. And I, and I think in Asia, um, one of the other elements that we will see in the next 20 to 30 years is going to be investment in sporting infrastructure. Uh, uh, and that's, that's absolutely necessary in order to um, create that that sports environment. So the Sports Hub is um, a tactical um, investment by a government that understands what it wants to take from sport and how it wants to use sport to achieve its objectives. And we're lucky enough to be involved with a consortium that's going to run that for the next 25 years. Um, and so you then start to look at the events uh, and you start to look at the events which um, embrace not only the objectives of what we are trying to achieve at the Sports Hub, um, but you also look at the objectives of what Singapore is trying to achieve in terms of its global positioning um, and, and regional positioning. Uh, and you also look at um, what Singapore is trying to deliver for its people. For, for, the, for the locals. Um, and you put all that together and we create a, a plan. Um, one of the challenges in Singapore in, in generating events is um, there is no seasonality to Singapore. Um, there's no seasons. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of the same, you know, wet or wetter and hot or hotter. The, the weatherman's got the best job in the world, yeah, hasn't he? Absolutely. We roll out last ten, nights. Yeah, yeah, ten minutes every morning yeah. comes in and out of the office. <laughs> So one of, one of the one of the vital um, I think strategies that we are trying to implement with the Sports Hub is to create um, some real um, landmark events um, throughout the year that you can you know say it's tennis season or it's football season um, and by put, putting these placeholders um, in 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 the calendar and and the key again there is making them consistent. Consistency is such a key to developing um, longevity um, around the success of this. You know, the WTA um, event that we have been entrusted with is a five-year deal. Um, our aim is to make sure it stays here for longer than that, and in order to do that, we need to be successful. Um, we take a leaf out of uh, Michael Roach's book. You know, he did a five-year deal um, with Formula One has now extended it for a further five years. We're hopeful of doing the same um, with the WTA championship. And the key there is everyone will know that at the Sports Hub in October it's going to be tennis season and they'll be able to plan their calendars around that. So the, the programming for the Singapore Sports Hub is going to be very much starting off with those key assets. You know, the, um, the football elements of the Sports Hub I think will be super important. Um, there's no... Um, and our research has confirmed what we all know anyway, which is that football is so far ahead in terms of um, local um, passion um, than National any other sport. Teams. And it, it is. It's, you look at the Suzuki Cup. You know, this is an event that that was started in 1996 um, and has become um, uh, the biggest biannual sporting event in this part of the world. The ratings for the Suzuki Cup uh, are bigger than any other sporting event in the year that it's held. Um, we had 100,000 people in Indonesia uh, a couple of years ago watching the final. The cumulative audience of the Suzuki Cup two Suzuki Cups ago in Singapore was two million people on a, on a home and away basis. That's, you know, w when you start talking about the success of genuine local sport, you look at events like the Suzuki Cup and you can really start to get a taste of if we invest in local football rather than actually... Um, importing football and sending our money into Europe, what we can create is actually something that's sustainable, it's long term and actually has much more passion for the locals than, um, than European football I think will ever have.
Indeed. Well, that's a, a great way to end up, ladies and gentlemen. We might throw some questions to the floor. If Ed, uh, I think some guys can get uh, a mic or two ready, if Jasper and Sid are there. Any questions, uh, if we could crank the lights down a bit, Ed, because my eyesight uh, with that from here is it quite bright. Any questions for Andrew, please? Surely someone must have someone. I have a personal one to do with the Sports Hub. Will it have uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capabilities? I don't know the answer to that. Well, it's a, something that keeps popping up uh, in conversations. It's, it's incredibly frustrating. You cannot use social media around stadiums where I was in Perth Saturday night in Brisbane. Uh, I, uh, Tong Hai is a huge advocate of um, the role of telecommunications in the um, experience of enjoying sport. Um, I, I don't know the answer to your question, but I would be very surprised if the, the entire venue didn't have Wi-Fi access. Um, so I, I should know, perhaps, but I don't. Well, and Bluetooth, there's some really cool stuff going on in the States in that yeah. space, isn't there, where you can deliver coupons and merchandise and ticketing and corporate hospitality, all sorts of things. Um, how many does it hold again? Uh, well, the National Stadium holds 55,000 people. Um, it's got about 67 suites uh, and it'll have approximately 1,600 club seats. I've heard you've already sold most of the suites, if not all. The suites are sold. Um, so we've had a tremendous response from uh, local Singapore corporates to the suite, to the suite products. Um, of, of the 1,600 club seats that have gone on sale, they went on sale only a couple of months ago, um, we've sold over a quarter of those ready. Um, so that's pretty good going um, as we haven't even really started our marketing campaign um, for the events in the Sports Hub. I think in Singapore and the region as a whole, I think the anticipation of what the Sports Hub can deliver is um, really exciting. Indeed. Uh, first event and official opening when? Um, the, the first event will be um, when the venue opens. It's um, scheduled to open at the end of March next year. Um, and I think there'll be football involved and I think there'll be music involved and I think there'll be um, quite, a, quite a ceremony. Um, I think um, the details of that opening event are going to be the subject of the start of a pretty intense marketing campaign. And when will you be announcing uh, who's playing? <laughs> um, you'll have to Christmas ask. Christmas time? You'll, you'll, have, you'll have to, yeah, maybe. Um, uh, I think um, we're going to be talking about that before Christmas. I think in the next month or two, I think you'll start seeing some interesting announcements in terms of um, what's coming up. Oh, very interesting, right? Very interesting. Um, yes, any questions? No, Someone? Everyone wants a beer. Everyone wants to get a beer. Yeah. Yes? <laughs> Responsibility of the stakeholders to come together and work together for the betterment of golf and to give more value to the sponsors? Good question. Um, I think sponsors ultimately want to know they're buying something that is stable. Um, you know, Giles spoke about the fact that, you know, reputational risk is something that sponsors take quite seriously. Uh, and sponsors don't want to necessarily be associated with something that um, can create any negative um, political or public reaction. Um, I think the, the challenge at the moment with Asian Gulf is um, there is a, a, le a level of uncertainty uh, around what is going on uh, and a lack of, a level of um, a lack of understanding about what's going on. And I think as a result of that, um, sponsors find it more challenging to find the safety in terms of how they sponsor, um, sponsor those um, types of events. Yes, anyone else? With community support being so important to keep a venue uh, open in a community, how do you plan to keep it accessible to the locals? There's so many events that are trying to eat at our paycheck, we're more discerning with where we spend our dollars. So how do you plan to keep it accessible? 
Yeah, I think I think there's two parts to to that answer. I mean, if you there's there's an answer to something like the sports hub or a venue that is looking to be uh, alive, you know, 365 days a year. And if you look at the um, programming that we're planning to put in there, there'll be um, what we call experience sport days that happen every week at the Sports Hub. And those experience sport days are um, free to every mum and, and dad and their kids to come along and actually experience all the sports that, um, that, that are played in Singapore. Um, there are 64 NSAs in Singapore and they'll all be invited to host um, a sports day at the Sports Hub. And that means that families in the community can come and engage and experience a sport and hopefully um, participate and, and take that sport up over time. Uh, I think the, the, the balance of, you know, return um, versus, um, you know, trying to make a buck um, versus community access is, is a fine balance. Um, and you look at a venue like the Sports Hub and you want to make sure that you are, uh, that it is accessible to everyone. So we've got recreational facilities um, that will be um, able to be hired by the hour. Um, you'll have facilities that are actually free of charge. Um, uh, basketball courts, uh, rock climbing walls, recreational water facilities, which will be totally um, free. Um, and then you look at other things like events. Um, and you look at events like the WTA Championship and what we're planning to do with the Fan Fest, as Stacey talked about it earlier um, today. And the, the, the idea behind the Fan Fest is to make sure that that kind of an opportunity, again, for the community to come and at least experience a part of the event and hopefully be intrigued enough to then um, buy a ticket to see the superstars is what we're trying to create. Um, a Fan Fest that runs for 10 days at the Sports Hub where you'll be able to visit and have your um, an autograph or a photo with Maria Sharapova of Serena Williams, I'm sure will interest the community. Um, being able to see how far you can serve or um, you know have a hit with one of the superstars uh, there'll be activities which will be accessible for everyone a and the idea is not not only to make the event or, or the venue um, accessible by the community but you also want to make the event authentically Singaporean and the venue authentically Singaporean um, you, you don't want to create um, a a second reality with these events where, um, and, and look, Michael Roach, I think, would admit that the Formula One for a period of time um, was perceived as quite inaccessible by most Singaporeans and they're working very hard um, to make sure that that event is now accessible. But the other thing that making it accessible does is it also makes it authentically local uh, and so that people who come to Singapore to experience the event can then also say, actually, not only have I seen a world-class event, but I've actually also experienced a little bit of Singapore. Um, you know, burgers are available in the paddock club, um, but, you know, noodles and chicken rice are also available um, because that's um, some of the local fare. So for me, it's, it's a two-way street very much because we want to make the events authentically local as well as giving access to the locals for the development of, of sport in the future. Yes, is there anyone else in the audience? Yes, the gentleman there, I think. Hi, Andrew. Um, Kenny Ager, Sports Revolution. A uh, question I've got is uh, relating to Justin's point earlier. We've talked a lot about rich content experiences, second screen, and how consumers are getting more from their sports experiences uh, online in front of the television. As a leader in sports events that are stadia-based, do you see venues having to catch up in that area or do you see it as a separate experience for fans? It's an interesting question. I, I was listening to, I, I caught the tail end of that panel uh, and this um, discussion about the second screen is interesting because there is an increasingly high percentage of fans that are using the second, cre second screen. Um, but the statistics, I think, say that only 15% of those people that are using the second screen have actually doing anything with it that relates to what they're watching on TV. Um, so with only, uh, and I, I look, I, I'm the same. I, I watch Formula One. Um, I'm a fan, and I, and I have the timing screen um, because I think it adds something to a sport. Um, but only 15% of people who are using a second screen to watch sport are actually doing something that's related to what they're watching. 
Um, and that then raises the question, well, what are they doing? Um, they're surfing the net, um, you know, looking to buy a car, booking the next holiday, um, you know, they, they can be doing any, any number of things, but they're not necessarily using the second screen to, to enhance their experience of what's going on um, and what they're watching on the main screen. And so I think there is still a huge gap, even when you're sitting at home, um, as to what that second screen does. And I think people's expectation of what that second screen does is much higher than where it is now. And so when you ask the question, of, you know, does, um, does live venues have to catch up? Um, yes, they have to catch up, but I don't think we're doing um, any good at the moment, even when we're not in the main venues, because I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Yes, I think there was one question there. Yes? Good afternoon, Andrew. Tomorrow is the launch of PES 14. What is the effect for Asian football? Because the, the AFC's first time is featured in the Pro Evolution Soccer game. Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, the, the AFC's development um, over the last 20 years has been um, significant. Um, we, uh, as a business, in fact, started with the AFC 20 years ago this year. Um, and there is, there is no doubt in my mind that the AFC will become the biggest football confederation in the world um, in, in a matter of time. And the question is, again, how long will it take? Um, as the AFC progresses through um, the next generation um, of fans, I think everything it does will continue to make sure that it connects with consumers at all levels. And, and everything that it does is to expand its competitions and its engagement to take, um, to take advantage of that. And we're, we're extremely supportive of that. The challenge, of course, is everything they do um, is also an investment, um, but the commercial reality of some of those things are, are not the same. Um, the ambition of the AFC and what it does in certain, in certain of its competitions um, does not necessarily meet up with the commercial reality of what the market is willing to pay for those, for those events. Um, but um, I think the coming of age of the AFC is, is certainly upon us and its role in, in the development of global football is uh, upon us. And I think everyone sees that. And I think, you know, like it or not, um, Qatar is going to host the 2022 um, FIFA World Cup. Um, Tokyo is hosting the Olympic Games. Um, this part of the world is going to end up, I think, dominating the sports landscape. It's just a question of when. Indeed. Well, uh Andrew, fascinating insights. We very much appreciate your time and your opinions today. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Andrew Giorgio, the CEO of World Sport Group. <laughs>